Again, welcome back, welcome back. If I had a gavel here, I would hit the podium. I don't know what to, uh, thanks, thanks for taking your seats. There's so much interesting stuff to talk about, isn't there? <laughs> um, so now we resume uh, our, the discussion of the morning. We have two more talks, and our next speaker is, uh, I hope, a familiar face. I hope you were all there last night and heard his wonderful opening keynote. Franz de Waal, who is the C.H. Candler professor uh, at, uh, in psychology at Emory and the director of the Living Links um, Center at Yerkes. And uh, one of the things that's especially interesting about, well, I guess the, the broad reach of, of this uh, symposium and the speakers is very interesting. But so you've already seen this morning there are some alternative views of uh, the topics on the table. And um, so we're back to Professor DeWall, who uh, will add to the mix. And um, only now, he's only got 30 minutes. So uh, let's begin. Well, since I've spoken yesterday for so long, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this actually shorter than half an hour. And, and I've just three sort of disjointed pieces that I, that I want to present in addition to all the material that I presented yesterday. Uh, I want to say a few things about community concern again, about crowding and aggression, and I want to mention bonobos once more. So uh, community concern, I think that, uh, I'm, again, I'm not sure that the, you find this in macaques or in baboons, but in chimpanzees, as, at least in captivity, I see that there's a certain concern about how the community is functioning, and they step in when they feel they can ameliorate, ameliorate situations, even situations that they are not directly themselves involved in. And uh, I've already mentioned mediation. I will mostly focus here on the control role. Uh, mediation is what I mentioned yesterday, is that sometimes older females bring uh, male, particip male opponents together uh, after a fight. Um, the um, control role is a very interesting role that we see in many primates, not just in the chimpanzee. Uh, this is a typical picture. This is an alpha male, actually, who, who was very good at this, uh, who is standing between two females who are fighting over food, this female and this female on the right. They were screaming over the food that's in the center. Uh, and they were hitting at each other, and the male uh, approaches, stands between them, and stops the fight. So he acts as an arbiter between them, and he stops it. And some males are good at this, some males are not good at this. Uh, and it requires also that the male has a lot of authority. So if you have a young leader, like I showed yesterday, Nikki, who was too young to do this, and the females did not accept this kind of behavior from him. And, and instead of stopping the fight between the two females, the two females would turn on him and chase him off. And uh, so if you have a, a leader who has that kind of authority and stops fight, he can be extremely effective. And what, what I find interesting about this behavior also is that the males will even stop fights that you, you as, a, as an observer, would think are not worth stopping. So let's say there's two juveniles who have a little fight. Uh, the alpha male steps in and stops it. And uh, I think it is because when two juveniles have fights, there's the potential... Uh, I, I hear that at daycare centers this happens often that the, the two mothers will get into a fight. And so the two mothers will get into a fight and then it becomes something very big. And so it's better to nip this in the butt than to stop even the smallest possible fight uh, because it promotes peace in the community. So this is an actual video of um, a male stepping in in a little fight among juveniles here. And he beats them apart and stops it. And so this is very common behavior. It's called the control role. Uh, it happens in primates, in many primate species, uh, but I think in chimpanzees it's very highly developed. And actually, Christoph Bohm, an anthropologist, he wrote, um, uh, what is it, hierarchies in the forest. And he made an extensive comparison in one of his articles of the peacemaking tendencies of males, uh, the pacifying behavior, as he called it, of males in gomba stream, uh, chimpanzee males, and uh, males in human communities. And so he feels that this control role is, is extremely important for maintaining cohesion in a community. And humans do it and chimpanzees do it. And he compared that in great detail. Now, it, there's actually, you, you can look at the data on this. There's actually some data on this uh, where we look at how animals interfere in fights. So you can, if there's a fight between two individuals, you can su support the close partner. Let's say your friend or your kin. Or you can support a distant partner. 
And we all would assume that most animals in a community will support, uh, will show what I call familiarity dependent support. So they support partners who are close to them. Now, alpha males, especially males in the control role, they don't do this. That's a very interesting feature of them. They become impartial. So they become an impartial arbiter. They interfere often on behalf of the loser, regardless of whether this loser is related to them or a friend of them, yes or no. So this is data on the Arnhem community long ago when we had three adult males like Jeroen Nicky, we had another adult male who was younger, a Dandy, and the rest is the females here. And this is how familiar, f familiarity dependent uh, support is. And as you see, the older males, especially the two oldest ones here, Light and Jeroen, who, who were by far the most effective control role animals, they become impartial, basically. They sometimes even interfere mostly against individuals who are their best friends. Uh, and Jeroen sort of 50-50. Uh, and the females go up to, what is it, 80%, 90%. They support almost always their best friends or their kin. And so that's a very different behavior. And I think animals who enter this control role mode, they become largely impartial arbiters of dis disputes and, and, and hence uh, stop the disputes. And sometimes females can take this role. Uh, that's only possible. I've seen this only in primate groups where the females are childless. So a female who has no offspring. Because as soon as the female has offspring and an extended family, she's going to be totally biased towards that family. So females can sometimes take this role, but it's unusual. This is data on uh, an, a male who was for one year alpha male. Uh, he, uh, this is winner support versus loser support. Winner support makes things worse, where you support the one who's already winning the fight. Loser support is, um, is usually a way of resolving a conflict. And this male, in the time that he was alpha male, he became a loser supporter. And as soon as he lost his position, he turned back to being winner supporter, which is a bit of a destructive activity where you make things worse in the community. So, so alpha males, if they're very effective leaders, they, they provide this sort of stability within the group by coming up for the underdog and breaking up fights in the community. It's a very important role. Now, um, if you look at um, what they may get back for this, it's a sort of interesting question, like why would these males do that and um, do they have so much interest in stability in the community? I think one thing they may get back for this is uh, support from the community, mass support from the rest of the community. They become popular leaders, basically. So I, in, in all the years that I've known, I've known many alpha males, I, I sort of distinguish two types of alpha males. One is what I call the bullies. So they are alpha male, they suppress the individuals right below them. They have to do that in order to keep their position. But they suppress everyone else as well. They terrorize basically the community. I believe that, for example, Goblin in the Gomba community was one of these bullies. And, and I've known a few of these bullies. And, they, and, and the thing with them is that in captivity, they end very badly. Actually, Goblin in Gombas ended very badly as well. They end badly because once they lose their position to a younger male, they have no supporters and everyone hates them and they're going to beat up on them and they may get killed. And in captivity, sometimes we have to take them out of the group under those circumstances. Then the other type of male suppresses also everyone right below them. They have to do that. That's the only way to keep your position. But they support the underdog. So they support low-ranking individuals and in return, they get a lot of support from these low-ranking individuals. So when their position is threatened, and that is the stabilizing effect that is probably beneficial to them, when their position is threatened by some challenger, the whole group en masse sort of protests again. This is a good leader, don't touch him, we're going to defend him. And also when they lose their position, which eventually always happens, they just drop a few positions in the hierarchy. They become number three male or number five male, but they're not going to be kicked out and not, not going to be attacked. So it's a very interesting distinction, I think, between uh, alpha male styles in a chimpanzee community. So Machiavelli has already wrote about it. It's better to be, to be alpha with the assistance of the common people than alpha with the assistance of the nobility, because the nobility is only out to get your position, and the common people can stabilize your position. So. We did an actual experiment on this with Jessica Flack on a different species. This is the pigtail macaque, where the males are, are much bigger than the females, and the males are very effective in controlling the society. And they do a lot of this policing behavior, very similar to what chimpanzees do, and I think also to a large degree in, in an impartial manner. And what we did in this experiment, we call it a knockout experiment, is we took some of these males out. So this is a graph that Jessica produced of the power relationships in a group of um, pigtail macaques, with the alpha male having extraordinary power 
uh, she measures this in, in spontaneous gestures of respect towards an individual, so to speak. And uh, the, these high-ranking males, they're not just one position up from number two, they are like 100 positions up from individual two as far as that's concerned. So, so alpha male is an extremely important position. And so in this particular experiment, we, we had a group of 80 pigtail macaques, and we took the three, uh, the three top males out. And we would remove them and put them in a building next to the compound. This is an outdoor compound. And they would sit there for a day, and then by the end of the day, we would release them again. So these were very brief, um, temporary removals, and then a couple of weeks later, we would do the same thing again for a second experiment and so on. So we did this multiple times to see what would happen in the group if you take these control animals out. The, the interesting thing is that if then there's a fight in the group, a big fight, uh, the females often run to the building and scream through the door at these males who are sitting there uh, to get them involved, but of course they're impossible to get them involved, and so they have to, to um, improve the situation on their own. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the data, but this is the data on, uh, uh, Jessica analyzed this for, in a nature paper, this is, this is the data uh, on, on what happened. I've just summarized it here, what happened if you do the knockout experiment. You get more fights in the group, increased fighting. You get an escalation of aggression, so you get increased injuries and increased violence. You get a drop in reconciliation behavior. Partners don't want to reconcile anymore after a fight. And you get a drop in grooming behavior and a drop in play behavior. So it's actually very bad what happens. Uh, we, we concluded that you get a disintegration of the group's cooperative networks. And so basically taking out these control animals has a, an enormously deteriorating effect on the society. So they're extremely important. So this is one conflict resolution mechanism that we we don't usually talk about, we talk most, mostly about reconciliation, but this is a very important one as well. A few things about crowding. Crowding and aggression, we've done many studies. I, I've, I've actually for 10 years been involved in rhesus monkey studies on crowding, uh, but I'm just going to show you, uh, just to um, show you a, a little bit on chimpanzees. In um, 1962, John Calhoun wrote this paper saying that population density, which I have depicted here by a bunch of eels, that population density results in social pathology. And he did these experiments on rats where you put rats in, in a small area and you let them reproduce so that they become more and more crowded. And these rats started cannibalizing each other and fighting with each other. And so he, he introduced this idea, which became extremely popular. And then Robert Ardery popularized it and said that the inner cities of the U.S. are crowded places, and that's why there's so much violence. So all sorts of violence in human society was explained by crowding. And I've never believed the worth of this whole story. Uh, because, for example, Tokyo is a far, far more crowded city than uh, Los Angeles. And guess which one has the higher murder rate? So uh, I, I've never believed any of these stories. If you do an experiment on crowding in chimpanzees, uh, we, in, in our case, we didn't need to do an experiment. We had the chimpanzees living on a one hectare island in, at the Arnhem Zoo, and, and in the winter, they live in a very small building. And so it's uh, 20 times smaller than the area in the summer, and so we could easily compare what do they do in the summer, what do they do in the winter. They're completely familiar with both areas, and so we could compare their behavior. Here you see a bit of the contrast. This is outside, this is what's inside. And this is what we found. So even though there's 20 times, 20 times more crowding in the building, there's only a 1.7 increase in aggression, frequency of aggression. There's a, a small but negligible increase in severe aggression, so, so violence doesn't necessarily go up. Uh, submissive greetings go, goes up dramatically. Very important behavior to the chimpanzees, the pant grunt, and it's maybe similar to what uh, Joan Silk was talking about, benign intent. It's an appeasement signal. It's really calm down type signal. Uh, social grooming went up uh, two times, and the only thing that dropped is play, and I think social play is actually the most sensitive to tensions uh, among primates more than any other measure. So this is what we found, and, and these increases are minor. And I think what these chimps do in, in, a, in a crowded setting is they do a lot of coping strategies, so to speak. They, they show behavior that dampens the aggression because there is an increase in tension. And if you measure, for example, cortisol, as we did in much later studies, you do see an increase. So it's not like 
the indoor conditions are wonderful and they feel at ease and, uh, and it's pleasant. No, it is actually stressful to them. And, and when in the spring we open the door to the outdoor, the, that's the most festive day for the chimpanzees of the whole year. And they, they scream and yell and embrace outside and they're extremely happy. So you couldn't explain that kind of happiness if the indoors was fine for them. So in order, when we, when we wrote papers about this crowding issue, I actually did an analysis one time of people per square kilometer and uh, homicide rates in different countries. You can do the same thing for different cities. There's basically no correlation. And for example, the Netherlands and Japan are on this high end of the crowding scale. The US is somewhere right in the middle of this whole cluster here. Russia, Colombia, very low, low uh, density populations. They have very high murder rates. And there's really no connection between crowding and and homicide in the human species. Finally, a few things about bonobos. Actually, you know, the positions of Richard and myself are not as far apart as they're advertised sometimes. Because um, I, I do believe that chimpanzees are very similar uh, in terms of brains to us and to bonobos. And so if chimpanzees have uh, lethal intergroup aggression and we have lethal intergroup aggression, there must be something similar going on. There's obviously some connection between uh, what the two species are doing. And even, even if that connection can maybe not be traced to the six million years ago, which, is, which will remain a question mark, even if that's not possible, there, there is obviously connection and we need to start thinking similarly about two closely related species doing very similar things. But I do want to say a few things about bonobos because most people don't know much about bonobos. Bonobos have, have, in my opinion, what they call a secondary sisterhood. Is they migrate out, the females migrate out of their community. They enter another community where obviously the females are not related to them, or at least the vast majority is not related to them, and they bond very closely with them. They have a lot of sex together, they groom together, and uh, collectively they dominate the males. A single female bonobo doesn't dominate a male. And we, we know that from certain zoo settings where they have one male and one female. And in that case, always the male is dominant because the male is bigger and stronger than the female. But as soon as you add a second female, it's going to switch and the females are going to be dominant. And so the females have collective dominance, which is based on non-genetic relationships. So you sometimes hear that only humans cooperate with non-relatives. Well, you know, the bonobo females are very good at it and they do it very effectively. Uh, and I've already mentioned that bonobos reconcile by means of sexual behavior. Almost everything they do that relates to tensions or uh, conflict resolution uh, involves some way of sexual contact. And the most typical one is actually not between male and female. The most typical one is between females. They are highly altruistic. Uh, I think they are the most empathic apes also. Um, uh, I'm just going to show you a little video. On bonobos, these experiments have not been done. At the moment, people are doing experiments on altruistic tendencies in monkeys and chimpanzees. I don't think bonobos have been included much in that kind of research. But this is just a little video clip that I got from uh, Claudia André, who runs a sanctuary in Kinshasa. This was a female who's being um, introduced to the colony. That's why she's behind bars. Normally, she would be out in the open with the rest. So she's being introduced, and she, she wants to be nice, so to speak, to this young male who is sitting on the other side. She's going to bring him some food. So she goes out of her way. She goes to a completely different place where she's going to pick up a piece of sugar cane. She's going to bring it back to this male. This male is not related to her. She's going to give him his piece of sugar cane, which he takes, and then he runs off with it. It's a good catch for him. So, so this is altruistic behavior. Bonobos, I've seen bonobos even show altruistic behavior in captivity to bonobos that they couldn't see. So, so for example, at Yerkes, you had some one time a situation where you had bonobos in two enclosures with a wall between them, and they would be handing fruits to each other around the wall. So they couldn't see each other, but the, the hands they could see, and they were giving each other food. So bonobos are a highly altruistic animal, uh, and I think highly empathic. Bonobos have been compared with Australopithecus because of the body proportions. Is that um, uh, Adrian Zilman has measured the body proportions of, uh, of bonobos compared to other apes, and they have longer legs relative to their body than the other apes do. And so when they stand upright, they, they look extremely human-like. Uh, there's a few differences, such as the feet, of course, very arboreal primate feet, and the arms are very long compared to the body. But um, in terms of body proportions, they are the most human-like of the great apes. They um, have sex where other primates would fight. 
Uh, so this is uh, two females doing GG rubbing where they rub their swellings together and the clitoris together and, and there's a very common pattern and this is the main pattern that fosters bonds between the females, I think. And this is a situation, a typical conflict resolution situation. A male has two oranges in his hands. The female has seen that, rushes over to him, has sex with him and gets one of the two oranges afterwards. <laughs> so, so that's a sex for food deal. That, that is actually very recognizable to us. I, I remember one time giving a lecture and showing this picture for an international audience and um, one Australian zoologist, we, we, we walked into a lunchroom right after my talk. He, he, uh, he all of a sudden jumped on the table and stood there with two oranges in his hands. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so we, we recognize the pattern. And, and my view on this is that actually this is a typical pattern for young females because old females are dominant and they will just take the oranges. They're, they're not going to have sex with the male for that. But the young females are showing this pattern, which is maybe the, the older way of doing things among bonobos when males were maybe still dominant. So this is a little video also from that same sanctuary, what happens if you give food to bonobos. These are bonobos are just uh, frolicking around at this point. Um, but then look what, what happens if you introduce food. Now the food is there, and they have sex. And so they're, they're having sex while they eat, or they eat while they have sex, is basically multitasking that they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and this is typ typical of the bonobo. So b bonobos, as soon as there's potential of conflict, and introducing attractive food is potential of conflict, or in the field when they enter a big fruit tree where there's potential of conflict, they go into some sort of sexual mode to diffuse the tensions, and, and that's their main strategy. And, and they, they are, on average, quite a bit more peaceful than chimpanzees are. So to summarize uh, things on the bonobo, in the bonobo we have female dominance, at least collective female dominance. We, I think they are the most empathic ape, even though, I, don't ask me for hard data, this is just an impression that I have. They're definitely the sexiest ape. They, they have um, a piece of DNA that relates to social behavior that is absent in the chimpanzee and that they share with the human. There's another recent finding which is interesting, is that um, John Allman, who studies spindle cells, spindle cells have only been found in the hominoids, uh, so humans and apes, not in monkeys at all. Uh, and um, Allman speculates that these spindle cells have to do with self-awareness, with empathy, with a sense of humor, he says. Um, so so a, a number of advanced characteristics. And when he compared humans with the other apes, the bonobos had the highest density and the most similar distribution of spindle cells, uh, more so than the chimpanzee. Uh, and so it is possible that also in their brain they are a bit more human-like uh, and not just in their body. And that's all I wanted to present. asking a question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah bonobos are um, a bit neotenous. We are very neotenous, meaning that you retain um, fetal or juvenile characteristics into adulthood. And uh, I, I don't know if our neoteny is independent of the bonobo. I assume it is, uh, because it has happened multiple times in evolution that these uh, that neotenous traits evolve. Um, yeah, the, the, I, I don't think we can resolve this issue at this point. So, so the question is, is the last common ancestor a bonobo-like creature or a chimpanzee-like creature or maybe even a gorilla-like creature? We don't have a way of resolving this. We, we can throw little factoids at it. And, and I consider, for example, the paleontological or the, let's say the, the bone structure data. I, I have trouble with that because... Um, uh, 
the paleontologists have not been uh, very good at uh, pl plotting out the evolutionary tree of the human species. As you remember, in the 60s, we had to completely revise it when we got the DNA data coming in. So I'm not sure that I would want to trust that kind of data to take the decision on whether it's a chimpanzee or a bonobo. And, and I think that kind of data will, in the future, come from brain research and from genetic research, much more likely than from uh, paleontology. So why well, should a chip uh, male be a factor? Why would, why would he be a bully? I think, yeah, I think would, there are different strategies. A, a chimp male desire to be dominant is, is pretty obvious to us because he gets probably um, uh, reproductive benefits out of it. He, he has probably more access to females. Um, this is still under debate, but, but I think that's, that's a safe hypothesis that high-ranking males have reproduced more than lower-ranking males. But then how you're going to be high-ranking, how, how you get into that position can be with different strategies. And, and as, I think there's a recent paper out of Gomba where they analyzed small males versus large males, and the, the smaller size males needed to do a lot of more grooming. So that that's, relates a bit to the issue that I mentioned yesterday, that if you are a small male, you can be dominant, but you have to be much more of a diplomat than a big male. A big male is, can do it with physical strengths maybe. But there's a cost then associated because he becomes very unpopular doing it that way. And so when he loses his position, he may get killed. Now, if he, in the six years before, or whatever his tenure was, if he has reproduced a lot, from the reproductive perspective, just the evolutionary reproductive perspective, he has done his job. And so then he can lose his life, so to speak. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up a bit um, on your comment on the paleontological evidence. Um, if you look at the... Um, Fossils, the, the, the um, fossil species that are intermediate between the last common ancestor and us, uh, they don't look much like chimps, they don't look much like bonobos, and they don't look much like us. So it's clear that um, that, spe that group of species uh, radiated into a very dramatically different environmental niche. So what do they look like then? Well, they have huge post-canine dentition, unlike chimps or us, or bonobos. They have reduced canine, unlike the chimps. They're bipedal, unlike the chimps. Uh, they have massive sexual dimorphism, it would seem, uh, unlike chips or us. You mean the last common ancestor of six million years ago was No, 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 no. The intermediate fossil species between us oh. and the last common ancestor. So the Australopithecines, largely. Oh. So they, they look dramatically different from either chips or bonobos or us. So it's clear that there was a dramatic evolutionary change between, um, well, maybe not between the last common ancestor, but between chimps and bonobos and those intermediate fossil species. And then there's another transition from those intermediate fossil species, which are dramatically different from all of the extant species, and uh, to Homo. And so I'm wondering, I mean, it just it seems to me that those data dramatically complicate a phylogenetic argument that either chimps or bonobos more closely resemble us, and that we really have to have a much more subtle argument about the value of chimps and bonobos as model species, maybe relying on... I don't know, but, you know, common uh, strategic problems that the two species face, things yeah, like but, that. Yeah, but I, d I don't think anyone doubts that since that last point of six or seven million years ago, uh, humans have changed more. Our lineage has changed more than, than bonobos or chimps have or, or, or the, the, the apes have changed because we became bipedal, we lost our hair, we got a bigger brain, we entered the savannah, and, and all sorts of things. So all, of, all sorts of things happened that made, made us change more, but it's still an interesting question what that last common ancestor looked like and what kind of behavior he showed. It's still an interesting question. Yeah, mm. Thank you yep. very much. I'm, once again, I'm, I'm interrupting uh, at, at this point because the line that the questions are going is a great setup to our last speaker of the morning, Michael Plavkin, who's a professor at the University of Arkansas, is the only guy on the morning's panel who actually is going to talk about fossil taxa. So he um, has a history of being interested in living primates and trying to understand morphological dimorphism in living primates, but that has led him to look at the fossil record. So the questions that were being asked are things that uh, can certainly be pursued after we hear Professor Plavkin's talk. If Except for the part that we have Otherwise to do. Otherwise, I'll be doing this without.
Mm -hmm. Now we're going to challenge my uh, computer locked. Oh, control out the leak. There we go. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to talk here. I feel somewhat like the out group here, talking about something um, very vague, uh, the fossil record and uh, comparative primate uh, analysis of sexual dimorphism and aggression. Uh, the title of the talk, Sexual Dimorphism and Aggression in Primates, just where do humans fit in? I want to focus on the fact that we use primate models to understand human behavior, and we place that behavior in an evolutionary context to understand the adaptive significance of it, and to try to figure out the kinds of behaviors that we've inherited from a common ancestor versus those behaviors that are derived. Now, both of them are interesting to look at, and they raise interesting questions, and it doesn't necessarily invalidate any particular analysis done on an extant taxa, including humans, to know that it's derived or um, uh, primitive character, but it does change the way that we view it, and it does change the way that we test hypotheses about these things. Uh, what I want to do in this talk first is talk about first uh, how dimorphic humans actually are, and then I'm going to go and look at the fossil record of these things, and then uh, talk about just how dimorphic those animals are compared to extant primates, and then uh, I'll go through uh, models that we have for the evolution of sexual dimorphism in primates and how those can apply to understanding the evolution of human behavior. Now, the fossil record gives us insight into ourselves, and many of us who work on the fossil record are interested in understanding the fossils for themselves, but I think it works the other way, too. We're interested in the fossils because we want to know what it is exactly that we came from. The baseline and the context. The models that we work with in the CF primates provide us an understanding of how to interpret dimorphism and the behaviors that we have. But the fossils are going to tell us exactly the changes that happen over time. Now, the first thing to establish is just how dimorphic humans are. And most people are aware that we have sex differences uh, illustrated here. Um, since moving to Arkansas, we have had to change this view slightly. <laughs> Part of it is still here. Humans tend to be slightly size dimorphic, even when you strip their skin off. It's pretty commonly known that females, on average, tend to be a bit smaller than males. Um, if you look at extant populations, about 10%, 11% on average across, some a little more, some a little less. Uh, the degree of dimorphism is significant. It's very real and present. And um, in interpreting this in the context of primates, though, we have to put it, place the magnitude in the context of the variation that we see amongst primates. Now, if we look at a couple of human skulls and a couple of primate skulls, that size dimorphism tends to uh, reduce a little bit when we look at human skulls. They tend not to be very dimorphic. Uh, we can tell male and female apart about 90 to 95% of the time from various characters. But it's nothing like what we see in primates. Here's some baboons. Oh, my God. Look at the fang on that thing. Male primates fight with their teeth, and they have canine teeth that are both stronger and larger than most carnivores. Um, only the saber-toothed cats have teeth that are bigger and sharper. Likewise, the size differences in these primates are spectacular in some cases by comparison to what you see in humans. Now, here's a couple of chimpanzees. The female skull is obviously smaller than that of the male. The size dimorphism is present, and humans do not have chimpanzee-like sexual dimorphism. Now, I always like to hang numbers on this. And so this graph over here um, illustrates the magnitude of dimorphism across primates. Increasing dimorphism on this axis monomorphism, or no difference at all between the sexes, would go right about here. The star is the human value, average from Smith and Junkers. We have a bunch of new world monkeys over here. Here are the old world monkeys, baboons and macaques. These are the leaf monkeys. And here we have the great apes and the hylobatics. Ancient gorilla, that's orangutan. We have the chimpanzee and the bonobo over here. And the gibbons over here. So the humans have some dimorphism, but it's less than what we see in the great apes, including the chimpanzees and significantly so. Now, people are interested in using dimorphism in the fossil record for inferring behavior, and they've been doing it for decades. I love this graph because it forces on the point that although we've used extant comparative models for dimorphism in the past to try to make inferences about mating systems and behavior, 
Look at all the kinds of inferences that have been made. Sexual dimorphism in fossils has been used to support reconstructions of monogamy, human-like mating systems, chimpanzee-like mating systems, bonobo-like mating systems, <laughs> promiscuous mating systems, gorilla-like mating systems, and multi-male, intense male competition. If you know much about uh, primate behavior, that's pretty much all of them. <laughs> it's not encouraging. It would suggest that the whole task is pointless, but we have actually made some progress on understanding the causes and correlates of dimorphism in primates. Some of this stuff has just been done sort of fast and loose. Some of it has been based on bad data in the fossil record and bad analyses. So let me go through now and first answer the question, just how dimorphic were the fossils? Over here we have a couple of Australopithecus afarensis skulls, and we have a couple of gorilla skulls put side by side, and you can immediately see that there is a similarity. But what we're more interested in is getting a numeric estimate of these things, and it actually is possible to do this. And let me explain this graph. These are estimates of jaw depth dimorphism. Why jaw depth? Because we got a lot of data on it, but we don't have other data, I'll just restrict it to this. Increasing dimorphism going up on this graph, and this is what we call true dimorphism. We know the sex of the individuals. Who's a male and who's a female? And dimorphism will simply be measured as a ratio of the male divided by the female. Um, it's the best measure we have, if you want to argue about it later, over coffee. Over here we have uh, two subtacts of gorillas, we have two subtacts of orangutans. These are the chimpanzees, this is your bonobo, and here are your gibbons. What do the hominids look like? Well, it's actually kind of complicated. Because in the hominids, we don't have a little label on it saying that the guy who collected this identified it as male or female. So we have to use various techniques to try and estimate the, size, the magnitude of the dimorphism. And people have argued rather viciously, I've been trashed in the literature recently by some people, trying to say that their method is better than my method, or their method is better than somebody else's method. So what I did is I used them all. And if we take the data from the hominids, which are right here for afarensis, excuse me, afarensis and animensis, also look at the scenes, here's your gorillas, and orangutans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gibbons. In these things, we've now estimated the dimorphism in the same way that we did it in the fossils. And no matter how you estimate the dimorphism, using three different mathematical techniques, the hominids always come out as pretty darn dimorphic. In fact, I think these methods are underestimating. When you talk to people and you look at the fossils, these methods are probably giving us an underestimate. So the answer about how dimorphic were the early hominids, if you talk to everybody except one person and his graduate students, the answer is very. <laughs> now, the next question is what was the ancestral condition of hominid dimorphism? Surprisingly, few people actually map this out on a phylogeny, and it turns out to be an extremely important task, I think, because it gives us a sense of the kinds of models that we're going to use, or how we're going to place these things in primate models. How is the dimorphism going to be interpreted from what it was derived from? Now we can do this by simply plotting out a phylogeny. Gorilla over here, Pan, and Homo. Now Homo has small canine teeth dimorphism, small canine teeth. It's been lost in evolution. We have a paper coming out showing exactly how. These little blobs over here are just to show size dimorphism, the triangles for canine dimorphism. And the first thing we know, or can assume with a great deal of certainty, and although you might not believe the fossil record, everything in the fossil record says that these ancestral apes were dimorphic. In fact, a lot of these Miocene apes were more dimorphic than any living animal, or primate, not an elephant seal. So the ancestral ape condition is strong degrees, very strong degrees likely, of size and canine dimorphism. Now let's go through a couple of models and first assume that we have a homo-like last common ancestor of Pan and Homo. And what I'll do in this analysis is to just count the number of steps and illustrate the changes graphically that would be necessary. You start with a homo-like canine ancestor. You've got to reduce your size dimorphism, and you're going to have to reduce your canine dimorphism a lot. Pan will then have to regain the size dimorphism and the canine dimorphism. The hominids, all of which are size dimorphic, there is no evidence at the moment for a non-size dimorphic hominid. Maybe somebody will find it. Loose or retain the canine dimorphism loss but then regain substantial amounts of size dimorphism, and then subsequently lose it. Count the steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, let's do the same thing for pan. 
Last common ancestor of Homo and Pan, whoops, sorry. You'd have to lose the size dimorphism and reduce the canine dimorphism to a Pan-like level, which would then be retained in Pan. Yes, there are differences between bonobos and chimpanzees, but in the grand scheme of things, they're small. The hominids would then have to regain the size dimorphism and continue to lose the canine dimorphism. Homo would retain the small canine dimorphism and then lose the size dimorphism. How many steps? One, two, three, four, five. What about a gorilla? Gorilla-like common ancestor, Pan would have to lose the size and the canine dimorphism. The hominids would retain the size dimorphism at the magnitude we see in the fossil record and lose the canine dimorphism just like we see in the fossil record. And then Homo would lose the size dimorphism. Four steps. Homo-like, six changes. Pan-like, five changes. Gorilla-like, four changes. The most parsimonious reconstruction is a gorilla-like level of dimorphism in the last common ancestor of Homo and Pan. Now, it might be not true. It might be that we find another fossil, but the fossil reconstructions for phylogeny are not a complete rearrangement. It's like building a jigsaw puzzle. The more fossils are found, the clearer the picture becomes. And while people alter the phylogeny somewhat, they do not completely rearrange it. It's like finding out that that picture of a flower went slightly down the left when you find a few more pieces. Not, oh my god, it's not flowers, it's sharks. <laughs> to understand dimorphism, we next have to look for the causes of changes in dimorphism. One of the most important things to remember when you study sexual dimorphism is that dimorphism can change as a function of changes in male and female traits. Many older discussions of dimorphism in primates, because the males, especially of baboons and stuff, are aggressive, focus on the male. But we have to remember that because dimorphism is a proportional difference between the sexes, it's both the male that can change, they can get bigger, or the female can get smaller. So in order to understand dimorphism, we have to understand both sexes. We'll start with the male contribution to dimorphism, since it's better known and less argued about. Sexual dimorphism is most proximately related, it seems, to variation in male competition. Males compete for access to females. It's classic sexual selection. Males, if they can monopolize access to females, will try it, and the greater the degree of the ability of the male to do so, and gain reproductive success by doing so, the more they'll compete. The more they compete, if there is a selective benefit or any size or weaponry that helps them win fights, the more selection there is for the development of such weaponry. Male competition actually leads to male reproductive skew differences in reproductive success among males, and it's the reproductive skew that leads to the dimorphism. But ultimately, it's not the male competition, but it's the monopolization potential of the females that's leading the males to compete. The males will not compete and risk injury if trying to get access to a female is not going to get you anything. It's risky behavior. And so this monopolization potential of the females drives the male competition, which drives reproductive skew, which drives dimorphism. It's classic sexual selection theory. Across biology, people will have this kind of stuff. Now, measuring this stuff is difficult. We have no measure of reproductive skew available from the wild for a comparative analysis. And the other things that we have are kind of brute force. And let me just show you. This is stuff I did with Carl Van Schaik years ago. Um, we called these competition levels. They were just sort of a baseball back to your face, brute force measures of what we call the intensity of competition. Are they hostile? Do they fight a lot? If they're a high intensity or low intensity competition, do they not fight so much? Are they not so hostile? And the frequency, which is a demographic measure. And what we found is that body mass dimorphism is strongly and significantly correlated with the degree of male competition, particularly the intensity. Other people prefer mass dimorphism or uh, uh, mating system measures. These are pretty much purely demographic measures. And as predicted, uh, monogamous species uh, have less dimorphism than more polygynous species. Uh, there's been some people claiming that there are differences in here. They're wrong. It doesn't work out. But nevertheless, it does confirm the theory, 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 um, that male competition is associated with dimorphism. As people have become more refined in analyzing these things, something that's come out in terms of re um, understanding the fossil record is that strong sexual size dimorphism can be associated with intense male competition, virtually always. Strong male reproductive skew and strong female monopolization potential. But if we have weak dimorphism in the fossil record, we don't know. 
because there are some species that are relatively, show relatively low degrees of dimorphism that seem to show a significant competition. So we don't know. The more data we have, the worse it gets. Where do the fossils fit in this? Well, this is, again, estimates of dimorphism in primates now sorted out into competition levels. I like them, so I'm going to use those. But it doesn't matter what you use. You always get the same answer. And here are the estimates for Australopithecus afarensis, africanus, Boisei down here. We only had two specimens. Uh, they should probably be up here from Charlie Lockwood's recent analysis. And what you find is that no matter how you estimate dimorphism in these things, they come out as falling out with these what we call high-intensity competition species. They are dimorphic, and they are not falling out with the monogamous, monomorphic, Species. They're not falling out with chimpanzees. They're falling out with things like macaques, baboons, uh, gorillas, orangutans. Now that would suggest that the males are competing for access to females. Now what about the female contribution to dimorphism? The female contribution to dimorphism is much, much more complex and we don't understand very much about it. The first thing we have to consider when thinking about dimorphism as a function of variation in female traits is what we call correlated response. Landy pointed out years ago that if a trait is autosomal and polygenic, if there's selection for the trait in one sex, it will be expressed in the other sex until that there is selection to break that genetic correlation. And Dave Currier, I believe, is the only person I know of who's actually proposed a model of how this is done. Nevertheless, there is some evidence that in canine size in particular, that there is some correlated response of female traits in these things. And you have to take that into account when you study this stuff. Now, dimorphism is going to be affected if females get larger or smaller. What are the things that could make females larger? Well, the current ideas that are kicking around in the literature are female resource competition. Females could compete for access to resources like males do, and like males, there could be selection for weaponry or size that helps them gain access to resources. Another factor would be lower female infant mortality. Bigger mothers make better mothers. It's Catherine Rawls' idea for mammals from 1974, I believe that paper was. Lower infant mortality is associated with larger size, so the females might want to get bigger in order to keep that mortality lower. What about smaller females? Faster breeding of females might make females smaller. If there's selection to increase the rate of breeding, it's been proposed, make the females smaller. Mature her earlier so that she can breed faster and up her metabolic rate, I guess, and She'll produce more offspring and lower the end of birth interval. Earlier breeding, start it sooner. Cut off growth and development right, and start breeding them early. Like an artist. <laughs> the other factor is to lower the metabolic demand. In seasonal environments or stressed environments, smaller females simply eat less. Having lower demand for food, if there's less food around, the smaller female might need less food and then have a higher chance of survival. Now, what is the evidence for all this stuff? Not a lot, actually. There have been very, very few studies. This is a strongly neglected topic of study, and it's a difficult topic of study, too. There is some evidence for correlated response. There's some evidence for female resource competition. There's some evidence for lower female infant mortality. A little bit for earlier breeding, and a little bit of stuff for metabolic demand. But the comparative analyses of these things are weak at the moment. Let me show you what we did with canine dimorphism to show you how important this stuff, though, can be. This is a plot of relative canine tooth size. And we like canine tooth size because it's a simple system. We understand what they do, right, what they're used for, and we can correct for body size. So we can compare canine size between animals that are very large and very small simply by using proportions and regressions and whatnot. And what we did in this analysis was we just took the males and the females and we estimated canine size in both. In the original analysis here, what we figured was what works for males should work for females. If males have big canines because they're used in competition and they compete for things, the canines should be useful for females if they compete for things too. Now, females generally are not competing for mates. They're usually assumed to be competing for resources. Then we figured maybe it'll be less, maybe more. But female canine size varies a lot in these primates. And what we found is when we classified behaviors in these things um, with Carl Van Schaik and Peter Kapler helped in this analysis too, um, when the behaviors are classified between high intensity and uh, uh, competition and low intensity competition, we found that the female canines are bigger in those species that were classified as high intensity and lower as those were classified uh, as low-intensity uh, competition species, just like the males. 
And there was another interesting thing that came out too, and that was the impact of coalitions. We hypothesized that if you fight with coalitions, like uh, Franz de Waal mentioned yesterday, that a smaller male can dominate others with help. If you compete between coalitions and the outcome of the fight is determined by the coalition partners that you enlist, then the weaponry might not be so important. And so we tested the hypothesis that animals where they uh, compete within coalitions, both the males and females, should have smaller canines than those where they don't, and the result came out as significant. It's a weak hypothesis. There's not a lot of data out there, unfortunately. We're kind of limited by the animals that are out there, but it is intriguing because it makes sense on the one hand, and the data do support it to some degree. <clears throat> There's another interesting factor that came out too. Uh, Jansen and Goldsmith proposed that uh, canine size, oh boy, I'm it fast. A uh, canine size in females, uh, or not canine size, competition in groups would be uh, higher in smaller groups because the cost of introducing a new member would be higher. And so you would predict the canine size would go down with larger group size, and that's what that analysis actually shows. And it actually comes out as having an impact on dimorphism. Here are these high-intensity female competitions, and what you find is that as the group size goes down, the canine dimorphism goes down. All right, now this does brings us up to an interesting question, and that is, when we look at dimorphism in the fossil record, let's not look at the magnitude of dimorphism. What should be important is the vector of change. Who is changing and how? And there are three models that we come up with for this. The first one is the most important, and that is this. We see this in macaques. If female size changes, male size changes right along with it in lockstep, and dimorphism doesn't change. What we're going to assume in this model is, and we don't know a lot about this, it needs work. If the female is ecologically adapted, let's say she's the ideal. The male is attached to the group. There is no niche dimorphism in primates. There's small differences, but there's nothing like what you see in lizards and birds. Males eat the same thing as females do. They're occupying the same niche. But they have a cost for body size associated with that, but a benefit in terms of competition. If female size changes and male size changes in lockstep, what that seems to imply is that everything is basically equal. You're not changing the monopolization potential of the females. You're just changing the size and changing the equation, and the animals are sliding up and down. Alternative hypothesis, female size stays the same, and males either get smaller or larger. The obvious conclusion there is that changes in male size are associated with a shift in sexual selection, cause unknown. And the third hypothesis is that males stay the same and females get bigger or smaller. In this case, the shift in female size is associated with a shift in female monopolization potential. This is critical because some people have claimed in the fossil record that dimorphism has changed purely as a result of changes in female size. But the males will change too, as seen in other primates. So if females change size and the dimorphism is lost, it means that something's going on in the social system that's changing the monopolization potential. There's two things going on in that situation. So what do we see? What do we know all that given the that? What do we know given all that? And the answer is not much, but it's intriguing. <laughs> all right, the first thing. Here's a plot of some hominid data. And these were uh, tagged out by Charlie Lockwood as probable females and probable males of various hominid taxa. What you see is all the females cluster together and the males change size. Boom. It's the males that are changing size, not the females. It's been recently suggested that hominids got dimorphic early because the females got small. No data for that. The Miocene hominids are the same size. Those models, though, give us a couple of conclusions that are very important, I think, for thinking about how we interpret behavior in humans relative to chimpanzees and gorillas and other primates. The first thing, if Australopithecines are size dimorphic, and they are, then it's most parsimonious to assume a gorilla-like level of dimorphism in the last common ancestor. It may change. Everybody who works in paleontology acknowledges that. It might. But we've got quite a number of taxa in the fossil record, and they're all giving us the same signal. And the second thing is that if australopithecines are size dimorphic, then chimp and human behaviors associated with dimorphism are independently derived in many cases. One of the things you find as a paleontologist is that when you do taxonomic analysis and you predict what the common ancestor is going to look like, the fossil record more often than not proves you wrong. Right? You can ignore it, but that's what we have as a fossil record. This is an important point because if we want to understand 
what we came from, no matter which one of those common ancestors you actually have, as the person asking the question before pointed out, you have to change the size dimorphism, one way or another. And chimpanzees evolved just like people did. So the chimp and human behaviors are most likely, in many cases, some of them might be primitive, and some of them might be, or some of them are probably derived. And that should put a focus on looking at these behaviors in terms of models. Why do we act the same as chimpanzees, and why do we have similarities? There are probably underlying common causes. It happens all the time in biology that things evolve in parallel, especially amongst closely related species, and are not simply retained from a common ancestor. Most intriguingly with this is that we think from the fossil record or strongly suspect that the change in human behavior that gives us our current social system, which is weird, probably comes within Homo erectus. Because if you look in Homo erectus, the Dinanese fossils from Georgia, which are very early, are very dimorphic, apparently. In the late Homo erectus, the females get big. And so what the fossil record seems to be telling us is that that third graph is probably what we're going to deal with. An increase in female size associated with a shift in female resource utilization and grouping patterns that alters the monopolization potential and changes the pattern of behavior. And then finally, just to plug this, is I think that if we're going to understand changes in human behavior, the changes in male-female size are the key to testing hypotheses about changes in behavior. It's the changes in size, not the absolute static magnitude that are important. All right, thank you. of uh, sharing food in hominids. Uh, how would that complicate your, your picture? You've ascribed uh, changes in male size relative to female as exclusively due to uh, sexual selection, but there is a possibility. Be ecological, uh, so ecological divergence between males and females, it could happen. Of course it could. Um, what we see in the primates is that um, there's not good evidence for it. Um, so if we're going to use the primate model, uh, for these hominins, then uh, you know we're going to have to say that niche dimorphism would be something that would only be we would only be able to to really test with the modern humans, and then try and attach that to the fossil record with archaeological data. Yes. Uh, the long distance running, I think you'll find from uh, uh, somebody who's working on torsos right now. I've heard is not uh, going to work out very well uh, in the long run. Right, <laughs> and uh, uh, as far as the meat sharing and stuff goes, I really don't know. Um, I have my own personal suspicion on that, and that is that what's happening in those Homo erectus is that the brain size changes are coming after changes in group structure, and changes in group structure basically are driving the entire thing. I think that if you when you when you try to boil this stuff down to a chicken and egg thing, a lot of these models that we have for human and evolution always come down to what started it. How can you simultaneously involve like males provision females because they have babies with big brains? except how do you get the big brains to get the provisioning or the provisioning with the big brains? Which one is going to come first? It's always a chicken and egg question. But what if you have a situation where you simply change the group pattern in a way that follows the standard models of primates and then literally exact the animal now to move into a direction towards humans? So if, for example, you set up these multi-male, multi-male female groups and there's no shift in brain size or intelligence, but all of a sudden there's a shift in the group dynamics of these things and the females now basically force the males to mate guard continuously by concealing estrus or ovulation and by fairly continuous receptivity. The male may not have to provision in that case, but boy, he's set up to do it because his reproductive interest is now tied to that of the female. And all sorts of interesting things start to follow out of that. You have to provision the females. Intelligence and social intelligence start to become more important in these groups. You need more protein. There's emphasis on hunting. The chimps do that, though, too. And you can start to spin these things out from an initial cause that is consistent only with the primate model. So, but you know, the archaeological data could prove that wrong. Uh, one more, or? I think I have to stop that just because uh, we're, we're already with the. Uh,